At the end of almost every level in a video game awaits one final enemy to test your skills. These enemies are usually faster, quicker, stronger and therefore more difficult than the generic scrubs you have been facing up until then, and they will require you to be at the top of your game. Fire Emblem is no different as it usually ends chapters with a boss fight. These bosses usually have higher stats and better equipment than most of the enemies you face and they often stand on terrain that gives them defensive bonuses, making them harder to hit and take less damage if you do manage to land a blow. Sometimes these bosses are just generics with a portraits and fighting them feels pretty trivial, but at other times these showdowns are built up over time through storytelling and character building. They can be the end of a long time conflict between protagonist and antagonist, or sometimes the only way to resolve the conflicting ideals of two former comrades, or people who really should be on the same side but are forced to fight through circumstance. One of the best parts for me for the boss fights is the music. Fire Emblem has a long record of kick-ass boss battle themes. I mean, listen to these absolute bangers. All of this is what makes boss fights tense and fulfilling. Ideally, a good boss battle combines elements like music and storytelling with difficult but fair gameplay. Unfortunately, those are not the boss fights we'll be taking a look at today. What I want to look at is the boss fights that make you shake your head and go, well that's just unfair. Where the outcome of the battle is not decided by how good your strategy is, but by how lucky you are. Because to me, that is the difference between a well-designed boss battle and a poorly designed one. But the one fun thing about these bad boss battles that we can run online about how annoying, unfair, luck-based and bullshit they are. So that is just what I'm gonna do. I'm going to list the 10 most stupid boss fights that I've gone through in the series. As always, when you do a top 10 of some kind, there needs to be some kind of disclaimer. For one, it's just my opinion. Well, it's not just my opinion, I also got input from a couple of friends, but it's still very subjective. The bosses that come to mind for you might not be the same ones that come to mind for me. And if that's the case for you, then feel free to leave a polite comment so we can engage in civilized discussion and reach a consensus. And if you're going down there anyway, don't forget to fight one of the two thumb bosses and maybe subscribe for more Fire Emblem content. But yeah, please don't take these choices and their exact order too seriously. There is no objective way to measure whether one boss is better or worse than another, but it's fun to talk about. Now with the disclaimers out of the way, let's get into number 10. Number 10 is Gomez from Fire Emblem Thracia 776. Gomez is the boss of Chapter 8X, the guidance chapter where Leaf reunites with Dagdar and Tania inside their bandit mansion. For blind players, it's a pretty damn unfair chapter because it has the infamous Thracia fog that obscures everything. Not just the enemies, but also the terrain, so you're walking around with no idea what you're getting into. If you try to move your two new units up north, they'll get a rude awakening from a large group of enemy brigands that can kill even the ridiculously bulky Dagdar if you get unlucky. If you do make it through the absolute onslaught of enemies in this chapter alive, you might think that the worst is behind you, but that is not the case. Hidden in the dark throne room is Gomez, a warrior boss. First of all, if you step into his range by accident, that could be the end of one of your units, and again that's easy to do if you're a blind player, but even if you know he's there, he is tough. My man is buff, he has 46 HP and 12 defense, but on top of that he's on a throne so he's actually got 22 defense to work with. Usually if an enemy is very bulky they are slow at the very least, but not Gomez, he has a massive 14 speed and at this point in the game very few of your units will be able to match that. Now Thracia does have one playable unit that has both the speed and the ability to bypass that insane defense of his and that is Asbel. Asbel can be expected to have the maximum of 20 speed, which in theory should let him double attack. However, the lightest tone that Asbel can use, the Grass Caliber, weighs him down by 3, and there is no way for magic units to negate that weight, unlike in the later Fire Emblem games. So Asbel is stuck at a maximum of 17 speed, which is one short of what would let him double attack. That's not all though. Gomez isn't just a tank in the sense that he can take a lot of hits, he is also an offensive threat. His strength is a massive 18, so with that steel axe he has 31 attack, enough to one-hit kill quite a few of your faster units. 
And if you use a more bulky unit instead, chances are they're getting doubled in one round thanks to that 14 speed of his. And he's not getting weighed down either with that thick 19 constitution. You can attack him from range instead, but if you stay in place on enemy phase, he has the option to shoot you with his steel bow. The throne also makes Gomez a lot more dodgy than a guy like him has any right to be. He has about 70 avoids, so you can expect to miss quite a lot. Are we done here yet? No. Gomez also has a movement star, also known as a vigor star. That means that every enemy phase, Gomez has a 5% chance to move again. Remember how tough it was for units to even survive one round with him? Now try surviving two. Now if Gomez is so tough, then why is he only at number 10? Well, at the very least he doesn't move off his throne, so you can fairly safely huddle your units outside of his attacking range and use them to rescue drop your attackers in and out and cheese him a bit. But Gomez is still way too infamous of a boss to leave off this list entirely. He has so many layers of fuck you, between the Thracia Fog, the unfairly high speed in a void, the massive bulk, his insane attacking power, and on top of all that, a 5% chance to attack again. I think he's well earned his spot on this list. At number 9 we have Boldo from Genealogy of the Holy War. If you're asking yourself, who? Then I don't blame you, because Boldo is not a very notable villain. He is just not a one of those greedy Augustrian lords from chapter 2, one of the most forgettable bosses in the series. The reason he's here isn't necessarily just because of the fight against him, but the circumstances. In chapter 2 of Genealogy of the Holy War, you and your units are running a race against the clock. As is Fire Emblem tradition, bandits are attacking an area with a lot of villages, and the only way to save them is to make it to Castle Hirhain and seize it before they manage to burn them down. Once you do that, the yellow units blocking the way there will run away, and you will also gain two new units that can help you kill the bandits. The first village that they reach is particularly important to save, as it contains the Valuable Bargain Ring, which basically turns one of your units into Jeff Bezos. In genealogy, villages are not destroyed instantly like in other games. Instead, a bandit will take their time burning it down, and only after 10 turns of inaction on your end will the village be beyond saving. But that village starts burning before you could ever make it there, so you are on a clock. That means Sigurd needs to make it to Castle Hirhain in time to seize it, and unfortunately before you can do that you also have to defeat Boldo. Now in the context of FE4, Boldo's stats don't stand out as much as Gomez's did, but he is still pretty beefy. He has 54 HP and 16 defense, so no one is likely to one round him. He only has 4 resistance, but he also has that barrier ring that bumps it up to 9. But what makes Boldo particularly annoying is his only skill, Pavice, also known as Big Shield or Great Shield. This skill gives him an annoying 14% chance to just straight up block an attack, no matter how powerful it is. This is FE4's most annoying enemy skill and it is super frustrating to deal with. Now in a vacuum, Boldo would not be the worst offender. There are bosses with higher activation rates for Pavice and higher stats than he does. But Boldo is the only one that is between you and a time sensitive objective. If you get too unlucky against him, that bargain ring village can just burn down and there's not much you can do about it. Now, if you could just throw your entire army against him, that would be one thing, but you can't. Castle Herhein is many, many turns of moving away from your home castle. Foot units like Ira and Holin and Jamka, they're not gonna make it there in time. You will be relying on your mounted units for this one, and not all of them will make it to him in the first place, since you also need to take care of the field army of Herhein, led by Philip. And Philip is, believe it or not, another general boss with Pavais, and he's got an even higher activation rate and even beefier stats, and you definitely want to kill him too for the return ring. Generally, I tend to make it to Boldo with Sigurd and Quan, as well as maybe one or two other mounted units, and they can have a pretty tough time. Even ignoring Pavais for a moment, hit rates are not guaranteed against Boldo, since he gains 30% avoid from the castle. And you can't just attack him over and over without healing, since his counter attacks are quite strong. If you go up close to maximize your damage, he will 2 or 3 shot your units with a silver blade. But if you try to be cheeky and hit him at range with a bow or the light brand, he will just switch to a steel bow instead. And he will switch during your turn, because enemies in FE4 can just cheat like that. And if your unit cannot attack him safely, they are going to have to wait to get healed. And of course, since your only mounted healer at this point is Ethlyn, you might not have as much healing as you need. So, Boldo is not just tough because of his stats or his provide skill, but also because the circumstances of Chapter 2 really limit your options of who can fight him. Honestly, I could have put any Pavice boss here because they're all really stupid, especially that group of barons with Hilda in the epilogue. But I find Boldo to be the most offensive example because of the time limit on the player when you're taking him on. If they hadn't given him Pavice, I would have been perfectly okay with him as a roadblock between you and some potential rewards, but instead the RNG can really fuck you over against him. At the very least, FE4 allows you to save every turn and provides 4 save slots, so you can save scum against him to negate the RNG a little bit. At 
At number eight, I have Dragon Bosses from Three Houses. Alright guys, spoilers coming up. Fire Emblem Three Houses is a Fire Emblem game, and that means that at some point or another you have to fight dragons. But I'm not talking about generic ones, I'm talking about some very specific dragon characters that you might not know about if you haven't played all of the game. Specifically, I'm talking about three bosses. The Turtle from the Leone Linhart Paralogue, the Windcaller from the Claude Paralogue, and the biggest spoiler of them all, the final chapter and final boss of the Silver Snow Route. If you don't know who these bosses are and you want it to remain a surprise, you'll want to pause the video right here and skip up to number 7. So all of these bosses have something in common, other than the fact that they're all dragons, and that's of course that on maddening mode, they all have another awful RNG based skill, Miracle. And Felix set us free. I live. I don't believe. Was I'm sorry. I don't. So. In three houses, Miracle gives the user a luck percent chance to survive a fatal blow, as long as they have more than one hit point left. Now, if they had just put this on a single unit that you just gotta kill once, like a normal boss, it wouldn't be so bad, but all of these bosses have four health bars that you gotta deplete, and these guys all have Miracle as a latent ability that activates for their last two. Except the Immaculate One herself, she has it on her last three health bars. Now, I know luck percent doesn't sound like much, but these guys are lucky bastards. Saint Indec, the turtle, has a massive 30 luck. Saint McQueel, the windcaller, has 33. And Rhea, the immaculate one, tops them both with 44 luck. Well, actually, that's just her first form. After she transforms, it even increases to frickin' 51. That means she's more likely to activate Miracle than she is not to activate it. Now, to be honest here, without Miracle, these bosses are tough but fair. These are challenging enemies that reward careful positioning and planning, the way a boss fight should be. But Miracle is a massive fuck you to the player. I would have been more okay with this if it basically had a 100% activation rate. If they just said, alright, you're not supposed to be able to kill them without reducing their HP to 1 first, but instead they made it luck dependent and you basically have to play as if they're always going to activate Miracle, so you're not totally screwed if they do. The reason these scaly scumbags are all sharing this spot is because I thought they all had a good reason to be in this top 10, but I wanted to discuss a variety of bosses. But if I had to pick one, it would definitely be Rhea. Not just because of her own miracle, but also because they had the audacity to give all the white beasts in her chapter miracle as well. And in a way, they are part of the battle against her, since she's really difficult to kill without defeating these white beasts first. So when you look at it that way, that's more like seven miracles that you gotta work through. So you can view this spot as just Rhea's if you prefer, but I wanted to mention McQueen and Indec as well, since they have a lot in common, and I don't think they should be let off easily. So that's all the Nabataeans coming in at number 8. Nab Nabatans? N Nabataeans? I have no idea how to pronounce that word. At number 7 we have Gomer from Fire Emblem Shadow Dragon. Now, Gomer might seem like a surprising addition to this list if you've only ever seen him in his normal, mortal forms. Maybe you've seen him in FE1, or FE3 Book 1, or some of the lower difficulties of Shadow Dragon. In those, he's just another pirate boss, not exactly noteworthy for story or gameplay. And why should he be? He appears in the second chapter of the game. By all means, should he be a pushover? But on Shadow Dragon's hardest difficulty, Merciless Mode, he is ridiculous. A boss in Chapter 2 should not have 15 strength, 12 speed, and a hand axe. That means that out of the 14 characters you can recruit at this point, he won rounds 11 of them at base level. And he will likely not be much higher than base level since once again, this is the second chapter in the game. This guy is insane. And just surviving a round of combat against him is not good enough to beat him, because it takes much more than that to bring him down. He has 36 HP and an effective 7 defense, thanks to the gate he's standing on. Ogma, who is the best character for facing him, does around 10 damage per round, and Gomer gets to heal between turns. Meanwhile, if Gomer hits Ogma, which he's going to do about 50% of the time, Ogma takes so much damage that a single heal from your bald priest isn't going to let him survive another, so Ogma will actually have to take this turn off if that happens. And Riss can't even stand next to Ogma to heal him, or Gomer will gut him with his hand axe. You don't have infinite healing either. You only get 20 uses of the heal staff and one vulnerary. If you want to heal more than that, you'll have to use the forts, and that takes forever. Oh, you want to try using another character instead? Good luck, the only other characters that can face him without dying are Barst and Kord, and they have terrible hit rate on him. 
You might think this is a job for Jagen, you know, the guy that's supposed to carry you in tough situations, but with only 8 base speed, Jagen actually gets doubled and one-rounded. I can't show this because my Jagen got a super lucky level up in chapter 2, but that only has a 50% chance of happening. Every other time, you're screwed. Oh, and even if Jagen doesn't get doubled, there's always a chance he can get crit and die anyway. But at least once you do manage to kill him, the worst is behind you, right? Well, no. In chapter 3, there is a very similar boss that's even stronger, Hyman. This dude also has a hand axe, but they made him even faster than Gomer. Hyman has 14 speed and only 1 point of strength less than Gomer did. Remember how at least Barst, Kord, and my speed plus Jagen didn't get doubled by Gomer? Hyman does double all of these, and he still has enough strength to want to kill some of the units fast enough to avoid being doubled, like Sita and Julian. Even the newly obtained Navar, you know, that fast swordsman we got, gets doubled by him if he's holding his killing edge. You can switch to an iron sword if you want, but then he's doing like 4 damage to his 41 HP. A clean 10 hit KO before considering healing. Oh yeah, healing, that thing you still don't have consistent access to. You still only have that one heal staff to work with from all the way back in chapter 1, because Lena unfortunately lost her men's staff when running away from the thieves. Guess where it ended up? On High Men himself. What a douche move by the developers, putting the fresh healing staff you need so badly on the boss that demands a lot of healing if you try to fight him head on. Thankfully, you can cheese both of these bosses by breaking their hand axes. It takes forever, but it works. For Hyman, there is also a faster method. Ogma still avoids being doubled, thank god, and he can use Navar's Killing Edge, so use the safe point nearby to keep your progress and just throw Ogma headfirst into him. If he doesn't crit, reset and try again until you do. When you do land a critical hit, Hyman will lose a sizable chunk of HP, to the point where Bars can probably finish him off. The things this game forces you to do, man. Looking at all of Shadow Dragon's early game, and especially its bosses, you can tell that a lot of it was not very well thought out or tested. The first three bosses just have heavily inflated stats, and because of it, about 90% of the early game cast just cannot compete. And even the few units that can survive around with the boss aren't capable of taking them down reliably. Instead, you have to rely on safe points, critical hits, or just plain wearing out their weapons to get past them, and that is just poor design. Really, all three of the early game acts bosses from Hard 5 deserve to be here, although you can at least use two range on the first one until he dies. I do enjoy Shadow Dragon as a game though, and after the first three chapters the game becomes a lot more fair in its difficulty, although there is one other boss in that game that we need to talk about. Spoilers for Shadow Dragon's endgame incoming, although I think to most people, what I'm gonna talk about is not gonna come as a shock. At number 6, we have Medius from Shadow Dragon. For these last few Shadow Dragon bosses, the most unfair part of them was that they were too strong for your characters to take on at base level, and that there was little time to train them up to the point where they could hold their own. But Medius goes a step beyond this unfairness. He is so strong that no matter how much you train your characters, they are still in deep shit. Basically, the whole story of this game revolves around the fact that Garnef steals the Falcon from Marth's dad, and Marth needs to get it back since it's supposedly the only way to kill Medius. So you would expect that once you go through the trouble of defeating Garnef to get the Falcon, that Marth can hold his own against Medius, right? Well, no, not on hard 5. Medius' stats here are outrageous. I mean, look at them. He has 60 HP, which is kinda low for a final boss, but he has 30 strength, 30 skill, and worst of all, 30 speed. This is especially unfair in the context of this game, because Marth only has a speed cap of 25, so he's going to get doubled even if you get lucky with his speed level ups. That kinda defeats the point of collecting the Falcon to begin with, doesn't it? Thankfully, the game kind of knows that Marth alone is not enough to defeat Medius, so they grant you a Maneki that's also supposedly able to stand up to Medius, either Tiki or Nagi. The only problem is that Manakeet also cannot avoid being doubled by Medius since their speed cap is also garbage. What the hell, Shadow Dragon? The only way you can avoid dying to Medius in a round of direct combat is to have a character with 27 or more speed, but there's only a handful of classes that can reach that threshold to begin with, and none of them have access to weapons that are effective against Medius since he's not weak to Worm Slayers or Dragon Pikes. There are some funny ways to cheese Medius though. One of them is to use the Broken Ballistician class against him. Beck and Jake can shoot him from long range, and with the help of forging and critical hits, they can actually KO him in a single turn. Another way is to simply accept the fact that one of your characters is going to die, and actually take advantage of it. On the very first turn, if you get rid of the Maneki that's guarding Medius, you can warp in Nagi or Tiki and deal a huge chunk of damage to him with the Dragonstone. Sure, your Maneki will die, but you can then revive them with the Arm Staff that you obtained last chapter, and then simply warp them in again. This is the strategy employed by Dondon in his 0% growth playthrough, and it works as long as you don't get an unlucky miss. 
So there are plenty of methods to defeat Medius fairly reliably even on hard 5, but I put him in this high on list anyway because the method the whole game tells you to go with leads straight into a game over. And I think that is dumb enough for a spot at number 6. At number 5 we have Gel from the Binding Blade. Speaking of reliability, you won't find any here. Gel, also known as Kel, is the boss of chapter 19 on the Sakai route of the Binding Blade and he wants none of this reliability shit. His stats are pretty good overall with 50 HP, 20 strength and 27 skill to work with and if you take the gate into account he actually has 16 defense. But his major selling points are his 27 speed and 15 luck. Combined with that stupid gate that gives him a massive 89 avoid. In a game like FE6 where weapons aren't exactly known for being accurate, that is a huge pain. These stats alone might not do justice to how strong he is, so just watch as some of the best units in FE6 try to hit him. They are having a lot of trouble doing so. They are nowhere near close to killing him. In fact, they're probably more occupied with just surviving him. Milady doesn't even reach 50 hit and she gets doubled in return. Only 9 damage per hit, but if Jell gets lucky he can actually double crit and one round kill her. And this is Milady one of the strongest and tankiest units in the series. And mine is not unleveled or stats screwed by any means. Then there's Percival, he is known for being RNG proof due to his super high base stats. He has 38 hit. That is the kind of hit rate you would expect out of an early game bandit against your units in your early game. Not your super strong pre-promoted paladin using a killer lance against the boss that he's supposed to have weapon triangle over. And again, Jell has that crit rate to worry about. Percival barely even survives if Jell crits once, let alone twice. Now Rutger, he only does 9 damage and he only has 51 hit and he doesn't double. The whole point of Rutger as a boss killer is that he's accurate and fast. And if Jell turns the tables and crits Rutger, he is dead. Now you might have noticed that Jell has a special weapon called the Light Brand, which as the description says is imbued with magic. That means he will counter attack even if you try to attack him at range. Fortunately if you do that he will only counter for 10 damage and with no crit rate. But the bad news is that there is just no accurate ways to take him on at range. Try throwing a javelin at him with Percival for example, it is quite a novelty to see Percival have less than 10 displayed hit against an enemy. A more accurate attacker like Igran with the killer bow has around 30 hit when trying that and she still gets doubled in return. The only remotely reliable way to hit him at range is magic, so you better hope you have a strong sage or some other totally legitimate high powered anima user to hit him with. And I think it's really telling that even this maxed out waifu only has around 50 hit on him when attacking from up close. Jell's enormous amount of avoid and a chance to crit anyone who tries to attack him from up close make him one of the most RNG based bosses in the series. The fact that most of your units have no reliable way to hit him is almost insulting. Thankfully he is the only Swordmaster boss in the Binding Blade. I will say there were several other bosses from the Sakai route that I was considering for the slot. A lot of them are equally terrible for several reasons such as the annoying monkey in chapter 18 that has two brave weapons and spawns more and more Anoa troopers all around you at the start of enemy phase. And there's also several bosses in chapter 20x where the siege point is randomized at the start of the chapter. And if you pick the wrong one, more enemies will spawn, as is tradition in Sakai. So you can think of number 5 as one huge shout out to Sakai and its terrible boss design, but I think Jell takes the cake for all the sheer luck involved in taking him down without getting killed in return. At number 4 is Rudolph from Fire Emblem Gaiden. When people think of Rudolph nowadays, they probably think of the way he looks in the remake, Fire Emblem Shadows of Valentia, but the boss fight I'm referring to is the original Fire Emblem Gaiden one. Rudolph's stats are of course very high by Gaiden standards, after all he's pretty important to the plot. First of all he's very bulky, 52 HP and 22 defense is a lot. He's also pretty tough to hit with physical attacks since he will often be on a floor tile where he gets plus 20 avoid on top of the 21 avoid he gets from his speed. In most cases of bulky bosses the logical answer is to resort to magical attacks instead since those ignore both the sky high defense and the plus 20 avoid from the floor but Rudolph came prepared for this. Not through high resistance, he only has 9 after all, but instead of packing a strong lance into his single inventory slot he brought the angel ring. Not only does this restore a bit of HP every turn, but it also ups his luck to a massive 40, and luck is just as much of a factor into magical avoid as speed is, so as a result, hitting Rudolph with a magical attack is even harder than a physical attack. It also doesn't help that Rudolph moves and is in fact capable of one rounding a lot of your team, thanks to his aforementioned 21 speed as well as his massive 27 strength. He might be fighting with a generic zero might lance, but he still packs quite a punch, and most characters have trouble reaching the 22 speed required to double him. There is a bit of light at the end of the tunnel though. Rudolph will not attack Alm, even if Alm attacks him from up close. 
but Alm is not exactly guaranteed to hit or do a lot of damage to Rudolph because of his aforementioned insane HP and defense. And the enemies around Rudolph, of which there are quite a lot, will attack Alm and kill him if they can, so it's usually not just a matter of warping Alm in and waiting until Rudolph is dead. I mean dead. Thankfully, the remake Shadows of Valencia has nerfed Rudolph's difficulty quite a bit. His stats are actually better, most notably an increase in resistance, but in Echoes the player has access to more options to increase power and reliability, such as through supports, forges and combat arts, making him easier to beat overall. But in Gaiden, fighting him with Alm is going to be a huge slog, and doing it with anyone else is really dangerous unless you manage to keep a safe distance. This tedious affair is so much worse than the epic showdown the game I've been building up to that I think Rudolph deserves his spot at number 4. At number 3 we have Henning from the Binding Blade. You thought we were done with the Binding Blade bosses, did you? Nope. There is one stupid boss left that we need to discuss. The hero that stands at the end of chapter 8x, Henning. Before Roy obtains the mighty Durandal, he has to pass one last test and it's a true test of your patience. By himself, Henning would already be a pretty big annoyance. First of all, on hard mode he is packing 17 speed, which is more than any playable character besides Rutger at this point. Thankfully he is weighed down a bit by his weapons, he loses 4 speed from his steel blade and 2 from his hand axe, but that makes him way faster steel than most of your characters can handle. Now, all of this would be okay if you had decent accuracy against this guy, but you don't. Henning is on a Binding Blade Throne, and Binding Blade Thrones are insane. First of all, they give 3 defense, which means Henning effectively has 15 defense on top of his already sizable 39 HP, but it also gives him a 30 avoid bonus, putting him at 63 avoid. I know that doesn't sound like a lot after I complained about the bosses in Sakai, like Jell with his avoid in the upper 80s, but don't forget, that was chapter 19. Henning is chapter 8x. You don't have access to killer weapons or Milady or Percival. Other than an early promoted Rutger, your best characters against him are... Zealot, Marcus and Deke, and they do terrible against him. They barely do anything. Maybe you're thinking of using a magical character to bypass that enormous defense. Maybe use an accurate fire tone to maybe have a decent hit rate. Well, I'm sorry I forgot to tell you, but Thrones also have a hidden plus 3 resistance, so he's actually got 6 of that. The only magical character you've had any chance to train at this point, Lou, is probably going to deal damage in the single digits, and he might just get doubled and killed in return by his hand axe if you're not careful. The only character that has an okay shot at beating him with any semblance of reliability is Rutger. And here's the thing, Rutger's luck isn't too good, so Henning usually has a low but very real chance to crit and kill him. And this isn't something you have to risk once, but several times, because Henning is too bulky to one at KO even with a Killing Edge crit, so I hope you don't want to start this whole chapter all over again if you get a little unlucky. Speaking of the chapter itself, it's super tedious. It's got these lava pits everywhere that flare up even with nobody standing on them, so every turn takes forever without emulator speed up. This battle somehow manages to be nerve-wracking as well as boring. Henning is one of the best showcases of how stupidly low accuracy can be in Binding Blade, and how boss battles can turn into RNG slugfests. If he wasn't on a throne, it wouldn't be so bad, but he is, and because of that, a lot of the fighting him comes down to pick God and pray. What a stupid, stupid mess. But at the very least, with Henning and most of these other bosses, the biggest annoyance is that it can take forever to beat them. Unless they land a critical hit against you, the most common way they punish you for bad RNG is forcing you to sit there for yet another turn. They make the battle last long, but at least you can take your time with them. And this right here is what makes these last two bosses so special. The fact that not only you have to get lucky to beat them, but you have to do it within a certain time frame or else you're going to get punished. And that's why I felt it fitting to put at number 2... Kishuna from the Blazing Blade. That's right, for number 2 I picked Kishuna, a boss that doesn't even attack. This one probably needs some explaining. So, Kishuna appears a total of 3 times within FE7, but the fight I'm referring to is his first appearance in chapter 19x of Hector mode. That chapter starts off pretty innocently, with you fighting a couple of mages and Pegasus knights, but then Kishuna comes in, sealing magic in a tentile radius around him. I think of this effect as kind of like a revelation gimmick, where it doesn't really make the map harder or more interesting, just a lot more dumb. It stops both your and enemy magic users from attacking when they're inside his range, but it's pretty trivial to circumvent for both sides. The most significant effect of the magic seal is that it stops the boss of the chapter from attacking. This boss, named Ion, has a bolting tone that he wants to terrorize your units with, but as long as Kishuna is on the field, he cannot use it. So Kishuna's appearance is almost a boon to the player. 
except that by taking away Ion's ability to attack, fighting Ion becomes really annoying and, you guessed it, luck based. When he's not being weighed down by his bolting and L-fire tomes, Ion becomes an absolute dodge tank that even your best units cannot hit properly. And because he's on a gate, only one unit can engage him at one range at a time. Now if you could fight him on both enemy and player phase, this wouldn't be such a big deal, but since he cannot attack, you can only fight him on player phase, which means that barring rescue drops, only one unit can hit him really hard at a time. Ranged attacks are no good, since javelins and hand axes are inaccurate, and of course, because of Kashuna, you cannot use magic. What makes all this even worse is that Kashuna doesn't stick around forever. If you take too long to hit Ion, and again, this is mostly luck based, Kashuna randomly decides to disappear again with no prior warning, and he does this at the start of an enemy phase. So Ion suddenly gets a free shot at whoever is in his huge range and can potentially kill one of your units. Oh, and by the way, your units cannot be healed easily since the turn right before, Kishuna was blocking all magic near Ion, including healing magic. And the moment Kishuna leaves, the friends he came with start moving. And those friends include two level 15 snipers with silver bow that can potentially one round a lot of your units. Now you might be thinking, hold on, this entry isn't Ion's, it's Kishuna's. And that's because Kishuna himself is even more of a bitch to kill. The first thing you need to know about Kishuna is that you have to kill him within one turn. If, after attacking him once, you do not kill him in the same turn, he will simply vanish. And the second thing with Kishuna is that just like Ion, he is way too dodgy. He has 25 speed on Hector Hard Mode, which gives him 50 avoid. Your most accurate units will probably have around 50 to 60 hit on him. This would be fine if he didn't also have so much bulk. He has 53 HP and 13 defense, so it's going to take several hits to kill him. Not much of a problem, except you only have one turn, and there's only so many attacks you can throw at him. And just like with Ion, your options to attack him with are painfully limited because you cannot use magic. As you can see, I have three of the strongest and most accurate characters attacking. Gi, Marcus, and a promoted Raven. And I still failed. And not just by a bit either. After I'm out of options, Gishuna still has more than half his health left just because of bad RNG. Not only do I need to get a Killing Edge crit, but I also need to land of other attacks as well. Now, of course you don't have to defeat Kishuna in order to beat the map. You could just seize, he is an optional boss. But if you want to go to chapter 19xx, you do have to. And even though it's not exactly the greatest chapter ever, you will probably want to try playing it at least once. Which means that everyone hoping to see all that FE7 has to offer will have to deal with Kishuna himself eventually. But even if fighting Kishuna is optional, fighting Ion is not. And Kishuna is a huge part of why that fight is so, so stupid. And that's why I think it's fair to put Kishuna at number 2. And now we've come to the point where there's only one terrible boss fight left. This one might be a little bit controversial, but I have nonetheless decided that the worst boss fight in the series... ...is the Black Knight from Path of Radiance. Now, let me make something perfectly clear. The Black Knight fight and the way it was portrayed in the story of Path of Radiance is great. I have no real issues with him as a villain whatsoever. In fact, I think the build-up to this fight is what makes it such a huge insult to the player. You think we're about to get an epic showdown between him and Ike, where Ike gets to show off how much he's grown ever since their first encounter. But what you get instead is a glorified slot machine. The Ike vs Black Knight fight is almost completely down to luck. First of all, if your Ike is RNG screwed, particularly in strength and speed, there is a good chance he just cannot win. The Black Knight's defensive stats are insane. He has 60 HP, an effective 35 defense, his 27 speed is too much to double even for an Ike with capped speed, and he gets back 6 HP at the start of every enemy phase. And here's the thing, once again, you are on a timer. If you do not defeat the Black Knight within 5 turns, you don't win. I mean, you beat the chapter, but you don't get to fight him anymore. It's the most lame resolution to a battle that was built up throughout all of Path of Radiance. So, in order to beat the Black Knight, you have to be proactive. Unfortunately, that is quite risky, because offensively, he is a beast as well. He has 48 attack power with the Alondite, so best case scenario, Ike is dying in 4 hits. Then, he also has that aforementioned 27 speed, meaning if your Ike has 23 speed or less, he's going to get doubled. Even if you don't get doubled, attacking the Black Knight is risky. He will always counterattack you, and there is a 30% chance he will activate his Luna skill, which will have your defense for a battle and thus make him deal extra damage on a moment you do not expect it. It probably won't kill you in one hit, but it could force you into a position where you have to heal instead of attack, costing you valuable time. Now, you do have the help of Mist in his battle to heal up Ike. The Black Knight will not attack her, but the reinforcements will, so on some turns you might not be able to use her to heal without risking her life. Now, if your Mist is untrained, this fight will be much harder, and this is a very real possibility since you joined so underleveled. And Mist is not like Elewood or Lin, who occasionally get forced deployed. This is the only time in the game where she is mandatory, other than her joining chapter. 
If you trained and promoted Mist, she is on a horse and can probably take a couple hits without dying. But if you didn't, she only has 5 move, cannot move after attacking or healing, and probably gets one rounded. Now even if your Ike is at a high level, he has enough strength and speed to stand a chance, and you trained Mist to heal Ike, and you don't get screwed over by Luna, you will probably still need the help of some lucky skill procs to kill the Black Knight. There are two good offensive skills that can help you here. One is Ike's mastery skill, Aether, which combines Soul and Luna in one hit. This can both help him get through that 35 defense more quickly, and it also heals him to protect him against the Black Knight's Luna. But of course the drawback is that we have to bank on him activating it, and that only has a 25% chance of happening. So once again, RNG. The other skill you could give him is Wrath. When below half health, Wrath will increase Ike's chance to crit by 50%. Normally, Ike's chance to crit is negligible, but with Wrath, that chance to deal triple damage is definitely there. But not only are we again banking on a random chance to get a crit, Ike also needs to be below half health to activate it, and that opens him up to dying to a Luna activation from the Black Knight. Now, I think all of this luck-based bullshit would be perfectly okay with me if this fight took place in a separate chapter. I think the fact that Ike has to be really strong to take on one of the main antagonists, and the fact that he can die at a moment's notice due to Luna and the Black Knight's sheer power, could have been a great integration between story and gameplay. But this isn't a separate chapter, it's the till end of chapter 27, and if Ike dies in this battle, you have to play all of chapter 27 all over again. And that chapter is long and tedious. I understand that it adds some stakes, but because of how RNG based this fight is, that is a very big punishment for simply getting unlucky. Thankfully, just like Kishuna, this battle is optional. If you cannot win, you can just have Ike run away, but that is so anticlimactic. The Black Knight is such a huge part of Ike's motivation throughout the game, to avenge his dad, and ending it by running away is so lame. This is part of what makes it a deserving number one in my opinion. It should have been one of the greatest fights in the series, and it sure feels like it when you win, but too often it's just a dice roll, and it didn't have to be. Alright, those are my 10 picks for worst boss battles in the series. There were a lot to choose from, but these are the ones I settled on. I would do a couple of honorable mentions, but I think this video is plenty long and I don't want to murder my editor. Speaking of which, I want to give a huge shout out to M for editing this video and making it look better than I ever could, and thanks to my Patreons for making it possible to hire talented people like her, especially my A tier Patreons currently on your screen, and especially, especially my S tier Patreons Boots42, Command Lists, Cory, Crimson Blader, Giant Corkscrew, Heliosan, Hunty Shurix, Ice Lake, Just Jacob, Moo, Nikhil, P. Vladias, Reese's Puffs, Scott Mitchell, Seraph, Skyler, Stuart Graves, and Swordlock. You guys are the best for making videos like this possible. Of course, thanks also go to Rin for making the thumbnail, and last but not least, thanks to you for watching. Feel free to subscribe and watch some more videos if you like, let me know your top 10 worst boss fights in the comments down below, and if you're down there, don't forget to beat the thumbs up button until it's blue in the face. That's all I got, I will see you next time. You know, maybe that's an argument to getting Ike Mist support. Do you get any bonus? Oh, you mother! mother.